In words of my mouth, the meditation of each and every one of our hearts here today, we'll please God, who is our rock and our redeemer. In 2012, we've been looking through, I've been preaching through my sermon theme of prayer. Uh, it has been a challenging year for me. I am not a naturally gifted prayer warrior. I'm much more of the type of person who likes to be around people. And the thought of going into a prayer closet and spending time by myself gives me shudders, makes me shudder, gives me chills, uh, makes me feel very lonely just thinking about it. But I know uh, that even when I go, Sue, uh, okay, go on home, but start to, yeah, okay. Thank you for uh, taking care of her. We did say a prayer for her, and I'll say another prayer at the end of this moment. Okay. Um, but the, uh, the idea of praying for me, it doesn't come naturally. The practice, I should say, of praying doesn't come naturally for me. It's something that I struggle with. So for me, 2012 has been a particularly challenging year because you know, as a pastor preaches on something, he is challenged to follow and to practice what he preaches. So 2012 has been quite a challenging year for me as I have struggled to uh, build up my prayer life, to be regular in my prayer life, to be praying for each of you. Um, one of the things that I discovered over the course of 2012 is that I prefer when somebody asks me, will you pray for me or will you pray for this thing, that immediately, if I just say, let's do that right now, rather than, than agreeing and promising to pray and then most likely forgetting about it later until I see that person walking toward me and saying, oh, I forgot to pray for that thing. Dear God, help that person with that thing. That thing, that thing, that thing pray for me. <laughs> that was that thing. I've been praying for you. How's it going? And, you know, and of course, then there's that hypocrisy thing that goes along with that. Um, so I have found that it is much more fruitful if somebody says, will you pray for this thing? I say, yes, why don't we pray right now? Then not only do I fulfill my obligation to do that, but I am more likely to remember it later because we've actually been in prayer for it so that at other times I'm more likely to remember it and pray even when I'm not around. Well, today is my last in the series on prayer. That doesn't mean I'll never preach on prayer again. It's just the last in 2012 series on prayer. And I decided today that I was going to preach a very selfish sermon a very selfish sermon. The main idea of today's sermon can be summed up in one very short sentence. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for your pastor. Pray for that guy who week after week in his brokenness, in his sinfulness, in his weakness, dares to walk up these steps, to stand in this pulpit, to turn around and face you and say, Thus saith the Lord, pray for me. God knows I need it. But not just me. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians says, pray for us. You know, Paul is the minister to these people. And he's saying, pray for us, your ministers. The people that we ordained this morning and installed, pray for your leaders. Pray for your elders. Pray for your trustees. Pray for those who are in charge of committees. Pray for those who are in charge of groups, the Women's Association, the choir. Pray for us. Pray for us as your leaders, because we need it. Paul admitted that he needed prayer. Paul knew that he needed prayer. Paul asked in 1 Thessalonians to pray. And Andrew, will you bring up the slide? Got a couple of slides here. This is the passage, by the way. Nan is the envy of every elder in the room today for her reading. I've already been accosted by an elder who said, What? What? I said, Nan, Nan pays me. I'm not going to tell you how much. I want to see how much, see how much I can make off of this. Brothers, pray for us. But this isn't the only place that Paul asks for us. He asks for the people, the church, to be praying for him, the minister, the leader, the leaders. Pray for us. Next slide. Romans 15.30. I appeal to you. Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Pray for me. Pray with me and pray for me. Next. 1 Corinthians. 
You also must help us by prayer. Help us by your prayer for us. Next slide. Pray also for me, Ephesians. Next slide. I know that you're praying for me. Right? It's assumed. He says, I'm your minister. I know you're praying for me. Next. Philemon, I hope I can return to all of you in answer to your prayers. Paul, next slide, if he gets it. Paul knows that the people are praying for him. Paul expects the people to pray. Paul asks the people to be praying for the leadership because Paul knows that he needs it. If Paul needed it, how much more do I need it? How much more do we need it, the leaders here at Winston? We need your prayers. I need your prayers. I need your prayers for many reasons. You know, recently I've had several people in the last year, in the last six months, people have come up to me and said to me, I'm praying for you, or we, my spouse and I, are praying for you every day. That is a humbling, humbling thing. When somebody says, I take time out of my busy schedule every single day to go to the Lord on your behalf. That is a humbling thing. When I'm struggling with temptation and somebody comes up and says that or that idea comes back into mind, temptation loses some of its grip. Sin loses some of its cling. When I'm struggling with laziness or apathy, I'm invigorated and challenged and reminded, such and such prayed for me today, or maybe they're praying for me now, or such and such and such and such and such and such are praying for me. When I have some petty annoyance that's bothering me, that's in the back of my mind, that I'm allowing to eat away at me, and I remember that these people are praying for me today, it just melts away, it disintegrates. I need your prayers. We need your prayers as your church leaders. Let me put it another way. If you want Winston to fail in her calling to serve the Lord, if you want the church to crumble, to weaken, to be mediocre, and to be a collection of people who gather to do church, don't pray for your leaders. Don't pray for me. Don't pray for us. That's all you need to do. If you want this church to sink into mediocrity, don't lift a finger. It will happen. If you want this church to fall by the wayside and become nothing more than a historical footnote of churches in your county, simply don't lift a prayer finger on behalf of your leadership, and it will happen. Don't pray for us, and we will fail. Because I guarantee our best efforts, our most noblest endeavors, our wisest actions will do nothing but cause disintegration, turmoil, frustration, aggravation, and failure without your prayers. So if you want the church to fail, don't pray for us, and it will happen. So if you want the church to be healthy and alive, it's pretty obvious what needs to happen. First Thessalonians, if you want a healthy church, 1 Thessalonians tells us how to do that. See, our passage, that short passage, that little tiny snippet that I had Dan read for you to pray for us, comes from a larger section in which Paul is talking about what it takes to have healthy churches. What does it take to have a healthy congregation? What does it take to have a thriving, vibrant, Christ-following, evangelical congregation? And he gives this long talk from uh, chapter 5, verse 12, all the way through verse 28. And in verse 25, he says, prayer for your leadership is what is important. One of the things that makes a healthy church. So if you want a healthy church, pray for us. Pray for me. A healthy church is one in which the people pray for their pastor. But a healthy church is also one in which a pastor prays for his people. All those passages that I just read for you, all those passages in which Paul is saying, pray for us, pray for me, pray for us, we need it, pray for us, I expect it, you are praying for us, thank you for your prayer. All those passages that I read, all come from books in which earlier 
in the book, Paul has said, I am praying for you. That he starts his letter saying, I'm praying continually for you, always, every day. I'm praying for you. And he ends the book by saying, pray for me. Pray for us. I'm praying for you. Pray for me. We're praying for you. Pray for us. I continually pray for you. Continually pray for us. In each of those places, Paul is praying for the people. It's a reciprocal relationship. So in one sense, my sermon is very selfish by saying, I need, I want, I've got to have your prayers. In another sense, I'm saying, you need, you should want. And many of you have already expressed that you do want my prayers on your behalf. And that's where I need to be as a pastor. That's where I'm being challenged as a pastor. That's where I need to grow as a pastor because I try to. But prayer is not one of my strengths, and I continue to grow in that area. So anytime you say, I'm praying for you, that reminds me that I need to be praying also for you. Say, so, well, how do you, okay, Dan, how, how do you need us to pray for you? How do you want us to pray for the elders? What sorts of things should we be praying for as you guys are leading us? Well, one of the things that we find in 2 Thessalonians 3.2 is that you need to be praying for our safety. Pray for our safety. Pray for the leaders of the church, the safety of your pastors, your elders. Now, I'm not talking just about driving down the road sort of safety, that too. But as I proclaim God's word, as I proclaim the truth of the Bible, there are going to be people who resent that, and people who hate me, and resent me, and attack me for speaking the truth. I am called as your minister to declare the truth, and you are called as Christians to declare the truth. And people are going to resent that. And people are going to respond and react to that. One way personally that I've already experienced this and continue to experience this, but this is a very good example of it, is um, we post all the sermons online. They're audio or video or both. And one of the sermons, the, the sermon that I preached for Easter in 2011, was about the, it was the metaphor with the donut, don't leave it on the desk, right? You can look that up online. And 700, last night I checked, 720 people have watched that video. 150 of them have said, we don't like that video. There are over 150 negative, critical, attacking, insulting comments on that video. Because another guy present, posted another video against it and all of his followers then came to watch it. So...